<laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, af after sorting out this little technical difficulties and finally getting a mic, and I hope everybody can hear me. All right. Uh, so um, uh, my name is actually Kai Kunze. I'm a PhD candidate from the Embedded Systems Lab at the University of Passau, supervised by Professor Paul Lukowitz. And uh, in the next 40 to 50 minutes, we will, you know, take a look, a closer look at the state of the art in wearable computing. Um, to get us started and give you a little bit. Uh, a common background or a common ground to start from some motivational slides. As I guess everybody of you knows, uh, currently we are, today we are in a state where uh, computing is embedded more or less in uh, all kinds of everyday devices. So your watch, your phone, uh, your gaming console, car, washing machine, and so on. Um, on although. <laughs> Although the <laughs> yeah, I, I have I have already so I'm fine. Okay, but okay. <laughs> uh, so. Um, uh, basically, computing is embedded in you know everyday devices and everyday artifacts and objects, uh, and uh, we think that it should support us you know in everyday life with our tasks, with our uh, things we need to do. However, um, usually it looks more like this. Uh, this is actually an, in the background. There's an, un, an unstaged picture of uh, of my desk at the University of Passau, so at, of our office, and uh, so basically. Um, the devices uh, we use today don't really uh, support us in our everyday life. They more or less disturb us. And if we have this embedded uh, technology, you know, uh, very close to us in, um, and near to us, so watch, mobile phone, and so on, the limiting factor no longer becomes, or the scarce, the scarce resource no longer becomes actually processing power or uh, memory, but user attention, so the attention of you. Um, if the mobile phone rings, you know, it disturbs your attention, it disturbs on what you were working on. And um, the vision of wearable computing or also ubiquitous computing, pervasive computing, I tend to use them interchangeably. Um, for me, they all kind of share the same vision. They come in different flavors. I know you can start religious wars about that, but uh, in general, oh, I forgot to switch on the demo. Hmm. Uh, but in general, um, they all aim at uh, supporting us um, with transparent computing, so computing we don't see, we, uh, computing that is um, inherent, uh, that is useful and unobtrusive as our clothes or uh, similar. And how this is done is basically uh, computing needs to perceive somehow the real world. So, you know, all the chips and uh, memory that is integrated in uh, these everyday devices need a way to perceive us. And, you know, how this is, of course, done now is using some kind of infrastructure sensors, you know, microphone arrays, some fixed cameras, uh, some other things, or body-worn sensors. So, uh, in this case, for example, accelerometers or uh, gyroscopes, um, and so on. And uh, this actually brings me then also to a first demo, how this can look like. If you look at the top, you see the little uh, um, a man actually moving. And uh, what I have on my body is basically two little sensor nodes, one here and one here. It's a particle computer from the University of Karlsruhe, uh, Tico. And uh, what should happen is basically, uh, you know, it recognizes if I'm waving over an accelerometer, and it should recognize if I'm sitting down. This is sometimes difficult. <laughs> difficult, please. No? Okay. 
Yeah, some problem with the live demo, but at least it recognizes uh, the variance in the accelerometer. So basically, the processing is done on the chip. I'm even surprised that it currently works on this setup because I needed to use VMware and some weird other uh, things to get it actually running on the laptop. But uh, you see, actually, the, the nice thing is this was a demo implemented uh, uh, during a diploma thesis of Josef Neuburger. And um, he basically implemented uh, all of this on the chip, so all the classification and so on is done on a small PIC chip, and I think um, around six. 64k of memory or so, so very limited device. Uh, yeah, I thought at least I bring some kind of demo with me. Um, let me just stop the demo because I'm not sure later on it might get distracting. Uh, okay, and continue with the presentation. Another way. Um, Okay. Um, another um, hybrid approach or also infrastructure sensor you probably already know is uh, the Sputnik, which is also available here at the uh, Kairos Communication Congress, the Open Beacon. Um, Britta and Milos actually visited us at University Passau two years ago and also installed the system there, so we have also running a system of Sputnik. Uh, in our lab. I just wanted to promote it because I really like the idea. They put out all of their uh, layouts and all of the soft software in open source and you can just basically download and profit from their experience as well. Um, so basically now we have these uh, sensing capabilities uh, in our uh, computing. So what do we want to support? Basically um, every high level user uh, activity. Uh, that you can think of, and here's just some examples. Um, so from everyday living, uh, so you know these uh, very mundane, very uh, old examples of the intelligent fridge or the intelligent stove, the intelligent house, and so on, or healthcare, uh, work, work and collaboration, so helping people uh, not to endanger themselves, uh, doing difficult tasks, more or less, and of course also sport and life, uh, lifestyle activities, so, you know, as virtual trainers or similar. And this brings me um, now to a small outline of the view. So we started off with the motivation. Now we will jump into the application scenarios. I'll give some of the, uh, some of more concrete examples there. And then we'll look at enabling technology. So, you know, what do we usually use at the embedded systems lab to build such demonstrators and such systems? And then I go into a bit more detail about actually my PhD work, um, opportunistic sensing. So I discuss some of the problems that current activity sensing or variable computing systems actually have and some partial solutions. And in the end, uh, we'll finish with some general issues. Uh, here we will basically talk about uh, two issues. One is how usable is this stuff? You know, it's maybe nice for uh, researchers and for geeks, but is it really usable for the everyday person? And another issue I can't get around uh, at the Chaos Communication Congress, of course, is uh, privacy and privacy implications. So let's uh, start off with um, um, a little video from one of our demonstrators. This is work done by um, David Banach, uh, mostly as part of the Way IT at Work project. This is a huge uh, integrated project. Mm. Doctors with their work in uh, it started, now I stopped it again, I guess. Ah, now it's working, okay. Um, and this is basically a system that was designed to help a uh, doctor doing his daily rounds. He strips on a Linux PC. This is a Belt PC, PC from ETH Zurich, the Cubic. Uh, he wears um, on the one wrist an RFID scanner, on the other wrist a motion sensor, and uh, sets up a Bluetooth headset. 
And basically with this, he starts his rounds in the morning and starting, visited, uh, starting to visit patients. So, you know, he walks to the uh, patient, basically scanning the RFID tag on the wrist of the patient. And with this, he triggers an event in the, in the system and he basically gets all the information for uh, the patient on the system. And then can use the motion sensor on his wrist, on his other wrist, to basically scroll up and down and uh, select the corresponding report and check the status of the patient. And there's another gesture, uh, you know, okay, now I think he'll show the scrolling. Yeah, right, so this is scrolling, and this is selection. And there's another gesture to basically call for an MRI or so. He can just uh, basically do this gesture and uh, uh, activate the Bluetooth headset. The context recognition part was implemented from our lab, so mostly David Banach. And uh, this is actually not a mock-up. This was actually in place for three weeks in a hospital in Steyr and with a fully working system. Uh, SAP was also, or is also a partner in the YIT project and they actually uh, did the back-end. So basically they did the interfacing to an R3 system, so we did a test run with real doctors, real patients uh, with this technology. Um, so, you know, it looks kind of maybe a little bit mundane, but uh, if you think about it, you re we really pushed this out to uh, doctors and got feedback from them. And so one of the first feedbacks we got is that, you know, this gesture uh, recognition with the hand kind of sounds all right, but if you use this in a doctor-patient context and you use gestures, you know, scrolling up like this or scrolling down like this and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> selecting, um, you run into some trouble depending on uh, the cultural context of the people. Uh, so the next demonstrator actually uh, used a capacitive sensor uh, integrated in the jacket of the doctor and you basically then he can basically scroll up and down by just moving his hand and then selecting uh, is then just a press and no longer a side movement. Uh, there were two different flavors, a bigger one integrated over here and a smaller one down here. One of the requirements we got from the doctors was actually that they have their hands free so they don't want to touch a stylus or they don't want to touch uh, a mouse or something similar because they might want to interact with a patient or uh, do some uh, search there. So uh, this is one application scenario in healthcare. Another one what we will look at is an indus industrial scenario. This is uh, some recording, some sensor recording uh, for quality assurance. Um, reenacted from, uh, from ETH students at Zürich. Um, uh, from uh, Skoda assembly line, so basically, you know, after a car is finished, what you have is usually a check if everything is all right at the end of the assembly line, this quality insurance step, and it's quite uh, tiresome for the worker because he might forget something. You know, you have to, you know, check each door, you have to open each door three times and things like that, and check that the steering is all right, check the, uh, all kinds of moving, moving parts of the car. And so the idea is later on to support this work so he uh, does not forget anything. And here you just see data recording, as I said, reenacted at ETH. We work closely together with them. This was basically, most of the work was done from Thomas Stiefmeier, student at ETH, and Georg Okres, a colleague of mine. And here you see Clemens, another PhD student from ETH, actually uh, performing these uh, uh, quality assurance tasks. And you see already that the setup is a little bit different. So you see more sensors. So you see these yellow bricks, they are motion sensors. Sensors. There's the norm of the uh, velocity and the acceleration from the hands, just plotted down here. And he was wearing uh, force-sensitive resistors sleeves uh, on each arm, so you get the muscle activity for each arm. And you see the raw data down here. And uh, the only thing that is actually now classified uh, in this video is the location. So we classify if he is on the right side of the car or on the front side. This is done with an ultra-wideband localization system, the two tags he wears on the, on the shoulder. And as you already see, uh, this looks very much different than this uh, use case in um, in, uh, in the hospital and this is more or less also how we do our data gathering because sometimes if you um, want to recognize specific tasks uh, like now in this um, 
uh, case opening the truck or closing the, uh, the trunk, uh, you sometimes don't know which, and you see you have this repetitive task, so he has to push it down three times and so on. Uh, you don't know what to look for in the data, so you usually use uh, you know, a more elaborate setup. Uh, my professor tends to call it Christmas tree setup, fitting to the season because you put a lot of sensor on the test subject and also usually use students as test subjects so they cannot really complain at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is now now I showed you kind of a regular or a more, more uh, extensive work in industry and now for the last uh, application scenario I want to take a look at more in sports and healthcare. Um, so this is work we've been doing since 2005 or so on, uh, trying to recognize Kung Fu move, uh, movements and here the emphasis is basically to, on the one hand, be able maybe to do a trainer, a sports trainer, that, uh, a virtual trainer that helps you do the right movements and on the other hand if you go to entertainment or so on, um, imagine you play Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat and you can actually really practice martial arts and the better you get you yeah, the, the more more energy it subtracts from your opponent and things like that. And here I we just continued with a new data set. Uh, uh, a student uh, whom I also partially supervising, uh, Gregor Endler, just started to. Um, record um, five to six new uh, students with also some new magnetic field sensors and we hope to, to publish something also in this aspect. So uh, moving over to now away from this application scenario, so you saw you know, from healthcare over industry to, to sports, um, there's a lot that can be done. Um, to more towards the enabling technologies and as you might have also realized uh, variable computing or ubicom or pervasive is a very interdisciplinary uh, field so usually um, you know you have the, the traditional embedded systems in there and usually what we do we pick the sensors you record some data you do some uh, offline processing with MATLAB and or SciPy or some similar tool that is really good for number crunching then you apply some machine learning maybe also beforehand some signal processing uh, techniques to do the recognition and uh, then later on to really implement the system you have to do a switch you have to go to a real embedded platform and this means usually re-implementing everything from scratch and um, some effort to overcome this problem uh, is basically the PhD thesis from David Banach. He focuses on the context uh, net uh, recognition network toolbox. Uh, this is supposed to be an envi environment that allows rapid prototyping for context recognition systems and all of our demonstrators and uh, all of my data collections so for Kung Fu or other things basically use this, this platform uh, to, um, to either record data or also do data to, to classify. And uh, some of the straightforward features is, uh, are that uh, the toolbox is data flow oriented. This means basically on the top you have your uh, readers, your sensor readers, accelerometer reader or uh, uh, similar. And then you apply some filters, some intermediate steps, some classifier onto it and then also some, some output device. Uh, you concatenate them and can do basically the classification Classification. It's component-based. It supports synchronization and uh, other things. Uh, f for the toolbox itself, it's open-sourced, LGPL. It's written in C++. Okay, not really my favorite language, but uh, David tries to keep it quite clean. Uh, and uh, it requires. Uh, the only thing it requires is POSIX threads, so it runs on a multitude of platforms. We have it running on the Nokia N8010 and also on an iPhone, iPod Touch platform and so on. So um, it's available open source, as I said, from SourceForge. You can check it out. However, uh, small disclaimer, this is kind of research uh, software, so the documentation might not be as good. As I said, a lot of people, uh, actually our whole lab and also the lab at, at ETH basically uses uh, this toolbox to do data recordings and also to build classifiers or demonstrators. Um, so. Another thing I want to pitch is uh, 
a student of mine just started uh, one month into his diploma thesis and wrote a little uh, contest locker application for the iPod Touch and iPhone. Unfortunately, it's not yet on the App Store because, yeah, it, it didn't get accepted yet, but we hope that uh, it'll be in, uh, in end, uh, mid of end of January. And what you can do there, it's basically just the start of his diploma thesis. You can basically um, just select some labels. You can specify some labels nothing, walking, running, hand wave, stairs, stair, uh, stairs up, stairs down, and then they get uh, shown on the recording view. You can start a recording, press a label, record some accelerometer data, and what you get then later on over uh, a, a web server that runs on the, on the device is a file where you have the timestamp, the accelerometer data, and uh, the label in it. So basically how this would work is uh, I select the label, I, uh, you know, uh, start the recording view, start a recording, press hand wave, do this, stop the recording, and then I can basically uh, take a look at how, you know, hand waving or so on looks like, and you can get a feeling on uh, how accelerometer data actually looks for different gestures you do and so on. So this might be just useful for uh, researchers or really people that are extremely interested in, in this, but you know, there's more to come. So he's just the one month into it. And uh, yeah, I'm looking actually forward to, we have some, some nice ideas, I hope. Uh, okay, now moving over from the enabling technologies towards uh, some of the issues and problems activity recognition faces today. And as you could see from some of the movies and also from these pictures, uh, yeah, um, this is not really practical for everyday life because uh, some of the setups take up to 40 to 50 minutes to actually get the person dressed into the sensor garment. You use, you use usually a fixed location for the sensor, fixed orientation. You know, the algorithm works just in case if you have the sensor oriented like this and if it turns, it won't work anymore. And you use dedicated sensors, so if a sensor fails, sometimes your, your classification doesn't work. And so one of the ideas, one of the pretty obvious ideas is to get over the dedicated sensors, uh, basically to use um, off-the-shelf devices that have sensors embedded in them, but then you have to deal with all sorts of different problems, as you can imagine, and this is kind of uh, also the work I'm uh, I'm basically doing for my PhD. So I just try to tackle several small problems of uh, um, of these huge ones. So uh, first thing, if you use uh, devices. Uh, that are not dedicated sensors, you might not know if they're on the body, and if they're on the body, you don't know the on-body location. So I did some work on trying to de detect the on-body location using accelerometers. And also, if you know the body location or the segment, uh, you know, you might have, a, or you might have a sensor integrated into your sleeve. Uh, if you pull up the sleeve, it changes and displaces. So I did some work on placement uh, on the body segment and uh, some other work I did, uh, and we will go into more detail uh, in, a, in a second in this one, is basically if you don't have it on the body, it's somewhere in the environment and usually Normal people don't care about uh, uh, X, Y, Z values or lo uh, longitude or latitude uh, values, but more about symbolic or semantic locations. So is it on a chair or is it on a desk or something like that? And uh, we look at this in a very specific example, uh, actually with a mobile phone. And basically what I used there is um, something all of you are familiar with. Um, if your mobile phone lies on, a, on different surfaces, the vibration sounds different. So, oh, I'm not sure if I, I haven't sound plugged in, but I hope maybe you can hear it. Hmm. Can you hear it? Okay, so this sound, this is the, uh, the, the cupboard. Uh, this is the chair, and this is then a metal compartment. So, you know, 
people can recognize on which surfaces they lie. So basically, we use this principle. And uh, what you can do with, uh, actually, this started out with me getting a new mobile phone two years ago or so on. It was one of the Nokia 5500 Sport. It, the nice thing about it is you don't need to use uh, Symbian C or C++ to program for it. You can just use Python, and it's a really nice scripting uh, experience on the phone. And you can, you know, let it vibrate. You can uh, record data on it, and so on. Uh, so basically, I played around with it. And what you can do is you can um, sample acceleration and sound signatures. So uh, you can play either a sound fingerprint over the, it had an MP3 in, 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 uh, player, a uh, speaker included. So you can play a sound fingerprint and then sample the sound back. So you basically get um, a frequency response from the surface the device is on. Or you can activate the vibration motor and then sample the acceleration and the sound. And then you get some idea basically uh, where it lies. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, published at Ubicom 2007. Uh, a paper, if you're interested in the machine lear learning aspects and so on, I will just show you some signal level examples now. So for the vibration acceleration, so if you let it vibrate on your home stereo or on your bed, the norm of the acceleration sensor, so uh, the magnitude of the, ex the intensity of the acceleration sensor definitely looks different. Uh, so you see there, there are different patterns in there. And also if we go into the audio data, so these are the fingerprints. Uh, for vibration, you see here frequency, so a slotted uh, FFT over time, over time here. Down here is the vibration for desk, and down here is the vibration for carpet. Uh, you directly see the difference. Uh, and also on top here, here I use this uh, um, sound, this audio fingerprint. So basically playing distinct frequency chirps in uh, different. Uh, in, ten, yeah, in different frequencies, so from 500 till 3,500 uh, 3, hertz. This was kind of the range the, the, um, the mobile phone could do over the speaker. And then you also see here the frequency response for desk and carpet definitely looks different. So you get some, some resonance in the uh, 300 hertz uh, chirp, for example. And um, using this, and standard machine learning, I have to one disclaimer here. Of course, this is done batch processing with MATLAB scripts and SciPy scripts. Nothing actually runs on the device currently. Uh, it still uses some heavy frequency domain features. So um, basically, uh, two modes you can use this. Uh, this, uh, this uh, you can use these features or uh, these frequency response. Um, you can use it on first pre-trained locations. This means you train it on a certain desk, on a certain chair, and so on. I picked around 30 locations in my in my home, and then you basically get the result. Okay, if your phone is on the office the office office desk. If you you know then ask the classifier, uh, or even in more interesting, this means that you would you know first you buy such a device and then you have to sample each location in your home where you might put it, which might not be so practical, uh, but it gives the better results. You can also train it on abstract classes, something like padding, uh, glass, surface, metal, stone, wood. Uh, for this, I went to a furniture store and basically you know, tried out <laughs> all kinds of uh, Device. Yeah, the weird thing is nobody asked me what I was doing with the mobile phone. Everybody was interested in the laptop, you know. I had 10 or 15 people asking me why I'm here with a laptop, but nobody cared about the mobile phone beeping on the, on the uh, 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 surfaces or on, on the, on the uh, tables and so on. Uh, yeah, and then you get basically a result like the phone is in a closed wooden compartment, uh, but yeah, you might then yourself need to look for the closed wooden compartment. Um, okay, um, this is so far to the opportunistic sensing. Uh, now, as I promised at the beginning, uh, over to the more general issues. Uh, here, I first want to address the practicality. And um, as you might guess, you know, uh, this is something I hear a lot, you know, yeah, it's interesting and there are some nice approaches in there and yeah, fascinating research, but is it really useful for normal people? And uh, to address um, 
this question, uh, we actually did um, an experiment uh, in maintenance scenario. This was work also where it here at work project with uh, Zeiss in this case, um, with Eson Katal uh, from Zeiss and Ernesto Kluge Morales from Biba Bremen, University Bremen, and uh, Florian uh, Wagner, uh, a student uh, who, who also works for our lab. And basically what we did there, we, we tried to assess, you know, how useful are, in this case, especially heads-up displays and uh, some way of context or error uh, correction for maintenance workers. And uh, so we picked the coordinate measuring machine at size and three maintenance tasks for this machine. Um, 18 participants. Uh, from these 18, none of them were volunteers, so Zeiss supplied us with 18 technicians, skilled technicians. The tasks are, you know, not something I could do even now after seeing it, uh, yeah, three times, 18 times. Uh, and we basically uh, gave them three utilities to do the, the maintenance tasks. One was paper, one was speech, and one was context. I go into detail uh, later what this means. And But we used the Wizard of Oz approach. This means that we actually didn't really implement an activity sensing um, system, but we simulated it. So, you know, we had our rules, and then basically pressed the right buttons for the rules. You have to be sure that, you know, it's something that not only a human can detect, but a computer can detect and you know we, we uh, really uh, tried to do this and really oriented ourselves on related work and also work we did in our field to make sure that we don't uh, implement something that is not feasible in real world. Uh, for the experimental setup, um, here you see this coordinate measuring machine, uh, the test subject then basically uh, in this case he had a heads up display from Zeiss. Um, if you want to try it out, I have one here later on or so on. Uh, it looks a little bit clunky, but uh, the nice thing is it's actually the first uh, heads-up display I used. That, uh, as I said, it looks a little bit weird and clunky, but uh, it's the first heads-up display I used that ha didn't give me headaches. I mean, I used several of those, and um, so micro-optical, for example, looks uh, a bit uh, sleek and nicer because you can just attach it to your glasses, uh, but uh, I couldn't use it for longer than 20, 30 minutes because after watching, uh, after looking at the screen, uh, I feel nauseated, and this has a really, really good quality. And it was not really done for the experiments. We wanted to use, actually, prototype from mobile uh, optics, but uh, due to practicality reasons we couldn't. So we have the test subject wearing the, uh, the glasses. We basically just have a VGA cable connected to the, to the glasses and uh, down here a laptop where, uh, in this case, Florian can basically uh, uh, steer what the technician can see. And uh, another display for the coordinator of the experiment um, to actually check what uh, the test subject or what, uh, what a technician actually sees. Uh, two ways to, for ground truth, one is a video camera uh, we filmed this with and also uh, an active marker system, an active infrared marker system you see here and you see he, uh, the technician wears some tags on the arm so we can basically localize uh, what he did uh, during his work and as I said we gave them three utilities to uh, fulfill the, uh, the task at hand. One was you know, the good old paper manual. Uh, in this case uh, as the paper manual for maintenance for this machine is around 500 to 600 pages. We uh, slimmed it down a bit uh, so that it is actually uh, usable and we use then um, this uh, uh, version where we just basically compiled all the steps uh, that are somewhere scattered in this manual. Uh, we use this to then build the display a device and the first, uh, the other uh, modality uh, they had or utility had was basically speech recognition, so uh, emulated speech recognition. They could just, this is a sample of the screenshot from the, uh, from what a technician would see on the screen. Um, 
if you wonder about the colors, they are picked because um, they give the best contra contra contrast ratio on the on the heads-up display, and it's very basic. So what you get is all just the information that is also in the paper manual, the picture, the tool you should use, and what you should basically do. And on the top, he has a progress bar to know how far he is in the step. And he can basically use speech detection and quotation marks so he can say previous or next uh, to step through the, the, the single steps. And in addition to this, so this was one paper speech. The third was then context. With context, we added uh, this bar, and this is an error correction bar. So basically, we defined up front some errors that might happen. One of them is, for example, touching the bearing surface. This is he's uh, a step ahead. He forgot, he forgot something. Um, this is using the wrong tool and so on. And uh, if then an error happens and we defined it as such on the list, this was uh, quite some tough work to always agree on what kind of error happens because you also want to give a fast feedback to the, to the uh, technician, then you get something like this and so then the technician gets a, gets, um, a warning uh, basically that uh, some of the task steps are wrong. And as I said before, so this is the visit of OSCO GUI. We're currently trying to, to open source it. There's no source code available yet, but uh, should be in a couple of weeks. Um, so basically, you know, you can control each step. Uh, you can control the errors that uh, are displayed and so on. And uh, now moving over, we did this now for uh, three times 18. So for each uh, each participant, basically did each of the maintenance tasks with another modality. Uh, and now for the results, uh, quantitative. Uh, oh yeah, another thing. Um, this is also, this is uh, not published yet, so you are the first ones to hear about this. Um, this is kind of, uh, um, it's accepted for publication in April 2009 at, at Pervasive. I uh, just wanted to mention that. And the quantitative, uh, nothing too surprising, so context is basically the fastest modality to use. Uh, it's 30% uh, faster than speech and 50% uh, 50 uh, no, faster than paper, uh, and also statistically, uh, st statistically significant. But more interesting, you know, we deal dealt with this uh, problem of is, you know, such, are such systems useful or uh, would normal, in quotation marks, people use them? And over here you see a question from the question mark, uh, from, the quest uh, from the questionnaire, um, Basically, the uh, technicians got asked if they would like to wear the system in everyday work. And as I said, there were no volunteers, so no tech-savvy people that uh, tried the systems, but uh, technicians that basically just wanted to get their work done. And 13 said yes, they really would like to have such a system at work, and just one said no. Four were indifferent about it, but uh, the one who actually said no had uh, specific um, contact lenses and couldn't uh, see the display very well. So, uh, and even more uh, overwhelming is uh, which modality did you dislike the most? And there were kind of all, uh, 17 with paper, so they didn't like the paper manuals they had now, and just the one that actually had problem to see the display um, at context and speech. So at least for this maintenance scenario, you know, for this limited set, we can say that uh, if implemented correctly and supporting the uh, users in a, a decent way, uh, it's useful. It's, it can really make a difference. Now moving over to uh, the last uh, general issue I want to tackle. This is privacy. And uh, the first point. I have to make, of course, you know, all these technologies, basically, if I wear a sensor on my body, uh, I give away a lot of intimate information about myself, and everybody has to be clear about this. But on the other hand, there ain't such a thing as a free lunch. So, you know, if I want to use a specific service, if I want to use a mobile phone, I have to live with that I can be traced or tracked. Or if I use a credit card, I also know the dangers and perils. 
that uh, this is also the second point I want to make and this is actually also the reason why I'm here today and so on just to raise awareness because I think a lot of people are not really aware of what you know such a little MEMS chip integrated in their mobile phone or so on can actually mean for them you know what kind of information can you actually data mine from such low um, uh, so, uh, such low level sensors um, and uh, the last point uh, for this is uh, kind of uh, then uh, awareness and basically um, yeah, also telling people what, they tr what the trade-off is, you know, if you use this technology, you have to live with that this and this information uh, gets out. And then also three, making uh, Big Brother smaller, this basically just means um, to um, help people make the right decisions for the right systems that preserves maybe a little bit more their privacy than another system would. And here a small example or a small idea we had while uh, Gerald Bauer, another uh, PhD student in our lab, was working for the Monami project. Um, this is a project that cares about you know, elderly and elderly home care. Um, and uh, so the idea is uh, keep the last puzzle piece with you. So basically, you know, all these uh, wearable computing technologies and so on work with uh, inferring some state, you know, using machine learning techniques. And do the last bit of reasoning, you know, the important bit on the local device of the user. This is something that might be implemented. It won't work for all the systems, but it might work for some. And what you see here, this is a combination of camera tracking. And the camera just gives away you know, this green circle. It doesn't store any ideas of a, uh, ideas of a person. It does not try to uh, put uh, any, uh, you know, to identify any of the persons. Uh, basically, it just gives you away this green circle. Then you have maybe a mobile phone with an accelerometer inside. You can access the service of the, the camera that gives you this green circle with some velocity to it. And then you correlate the accelerometer on your local device with the green dots. And then you basically know mm, which dot you are and get your location without uh, losing your privacy. And so this is one example. So you see iPhone activity is on one and camera activity is also on one. Then uh, Gerald stops and then you see, okay, iPhone acti uh, camera activity goes to zero and also the iPhone, acti uh, the iPhone activity goes to zero. And he, if he moves, the iPhone activity stays on. And you know, if he goes out of the uh, area where the camera is, of course, the camera uh, activity goes to zero. So of course, I mean, this won't solve uh, all of our privacy problems and so on with this technology, but it might be a help or a hint for people that try to design those systems. And that actually also brings me to the end of the presentation, here are the, the links of our institute. Uh, if you're interested in the machine learning aspect and you know how to really build those systems, we have also a wiki in place where um, I put some tutorials from uh, a course I also teach, Intelligent Technical Systems. You can step through the, uh, to the, uh, through the uh, tutorials and actually see how to really build such systems and how to you know, combine signal processing, machine learning, AI techniques. Uh, to build them, of course, you can uh, get our toolbox or, you know, also um, you get in touch with me if you have, or also now if you have now any questions, remarks, violent dissent. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Do, do, do we have a microphone for the... Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah. Can you buy the glasses? The glasses? Yeah. Uh, the question was uh, if you can buy the glasses. Actually, you could buy the glasses, but currently the state of, as far as I know, the state of mobile optics uh, size is unknown. Uh, they wanted to basically stop the whole department. And uh, now there's some discussion about it. I hope that this is resolved. and. They, they continue the production. You could buy them, you might be able to find them somewhere. They were actually produced for medical applications. Yeah. Some more questions?
Yeah, the, 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 you, what, what, and if the color varies, it, I mean, uh, the, the color varies from the display here. Yes, it does a bit, but not that much. I mean, it depends on uh, the problem there is depending on what color you use. You have to live with uh, the problem with these displays is um, that uh, if you get too close to the eye. Um, you, you have this issue that you cannot focus. So they play little tricks and depending on what colors you use, you get ghost images. So if you use, in this case, if you use uh, black on white, it, the, the contrast ratio is all right, but you get a ghost image of the uh, written text just behind it somewhere, so you cannot really read it. That's the trouble with, uh, with the displays. So you yeah, always have to be, be a bit careful to, to, to choose the right colors. It can defect different eyes. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Do you work with the materials connections? A, a little bit. Uh, people at ETH do, but okay. No.